Hey, you, have you ever got it wrong? Have you ever said something that you just want to take back? Have you ever fucked it up because you just made the wrong decision? Ever had a moment in your life when you wish you could undo what you've just done. Betty, Alice, Susie Mae, Doran, Vanessa, Diane, and James Jr. Something went wrong here. There is about to be a terrible mistake. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Are you good? I am. Okay, shout outs. Shout outs go to Derek Walker. How are you, Derek? Really nice of you to get in touch and offer to help me with some audio support. Thank you. Abigail W. Stevens, your posts on the Facebook group are a joy. Thank you, Abigail. Sheena Powell. Sheena, you're just the best. I just, I love it. Sheena, keep your, keep your Facebook posts and keep all of that coming. It's great. Okay, before we go on, I'm just going to tell you um, a little update on Mrs. X and her husband who, if you remember from a few episodes ago, she got in contact with me to say that her her husband had some issues with um, her listening to the podcast and her saying that she particularly liked my voice and then I tried to do a sexy voice and it kind of all went wrong. Guess who got in touch with me? Mr X himself. Yes, Mr. X sent me an email and it, uh, yeah, unbelievably, he sent me an email and it says this, Dear Barry or Baz, I'm not sure what you go by. Um, for future reference, either of those is fine. He writes, My wife played me the episode where you mentioned us and you tried to do your sexy voice. <laughs> and I love this. He says, it wasn't sexy. It just creeped me out. <laughs> oh, what a man. He goes on to say, and this is like, I feel like this bit in the email is like a whisper. He says, I started to listen secretly to the podcast and now I'm binging all of the episodes. He says I'm on pod I'm on uh, episode number thirteen and I'm absolutely loving it. And he signs off with this, which I love. He says, My wife loves your voice and now I do too. Good health to you and your voice. He says I now hear things in a Scottish accent and me and my wife <laughs> 
do impressions of you. Hi, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? And what the fuck? And we laugh at how silly we sound in our American accents. He finishes, good luck to you and keep it up, Mr. X. <laughs> I just love that. I just, it's so, it's so brilliant. I just, oh uh, yeah, I just think it's really funny. It's just really odd that this couple are having this. Yeah, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. I just, I just think it's really funny. Okay, so this story that we're going to get to. Today, I'm just going to, I'm not going to babble on forever. I promise I'm going to get to the story. So what I, what I kind of need to say about this is, and I mean, this is like kind of me letting you into the process of how, how I arrive at stories. Quite often what will happen is I get sort of taken by an idea rather than a story. So I'll say to myself, oh, I'd quite like a story that was about like, someone who lived their life as a lie or I quite like someone who survived something absolutely exceptional or whatever you know I just that that's kind of where I go from rather than actually I want the story it's just more often I want a story that's around this theme Now, there is a theme that I have been thinking of for so long, for so, so long, and I could never find the right story, and I fucking happened upon it a week ago, and I'm so happy that I did. I'm not going to tell you what the theme is, because it will give away the whole story, but I'm going to stop babbling on And we're going to get to the story of James Richardson. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Okay, James Richardson. Who was he? Well, James Richardson was a husband. And a father. He was a father to many, many children. But he lived with his wife, Annie Mae, in Florida in the 1960s. Let's get a picture of what their life is. So James Richardson and his wife, Annie Mae, they live in Arcadia. A part of Florida. They were a poor family and they had little in the way of luxury or belongings. And I mean, this is not to be cheesy. This is not to be fucking cheesy when I say this. What they did have was they had a loving home. The home was an apartment block which they shared with lots of neighbours and friends. They just lived in a two-bedroom apartment. So, seven kids in one room. James and Annie in the other. Now, they were a hard-working couple and, well, of course, they fucking had to be. They had seven children aged between 2 and 11. They had six girls and one boy. Now, it's slightly complicated how they got here. Bear with me for a second. Four of the girls were from Annie's previous marriage. One of them was from James his previous marriage, and two they'd had together. But, I mean, that's not really anything that's relevant to the story, but it's worth noting that the family was made up of seven kids that weren't all created by the couple. Anyway, happily living as a family, 
the nine of them living in one house. I mean, it must have been so chaotic. Just the nine of them living in that house, like, just must have been mad. So what did James and his wife Annie do for a living? Well, they were citrus pickers. A really gruelling job, a physically hard job to do. Long, long hours. They would spend up to 15 hours a day going into fields and picking oranges. Now the area that they lived in, Arcadia in Florida, was... And I fucking hate this. I fucking... I hate that this ever existed or still exists or is even a part of life. I fucking hate this. The area they lived in was designated for African Americans to live in, forced to live in these areas. And I know we could go down the whole road of fucking poverty. We could go down all these roads of like talking about segregation. We could talk about all these things. I just hate that these two with their seven kids were forced into an area to live where the other African Americans lived. So, each day they would go to work and they would work incredibly long hours and they relied on babysitters. Let's go to the day in question. And it goes like this. Annie wakes up early and she starts to prepare food for the day. Now, a family of nine, oh God, you've got to be prepared. God, I can barely manage to organise my own lunch sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I can barely or I can barely organise my own eating in a day. <laughs> I'm like one person. So she's got nine people to be thinking about herself, her husband and the seven kids. So she gets up at 6.30 in the morning and she fries some chicken. And the chicken is for her and her husband James to take to work. And she makes food for the seven kids. And the food that she makes is rice, it's leftover rice. And she fries it up with some beans. And there's plenty of it. There's plenty of food there to feed all of those kids. Now, the eldest daughter, Betty Jean, she's responsible for getting the kids up for school, getting the younger ones up. She's only like, I think Betty Jean is only like 11 years old, but she's actually like responsible for getting them up, getting them ready for school, getting them dressed, whatever. So they're all chaotically trying to get out of the house in the morning and Betty Jean makes sure that all the kids are dressed properly and they're sent off to school. So James and Annie are heading out to work. So I said that their job was citrus picking and it was specifically picking oranges. For each crate they could fill, they would receive 25 cents. And most weeks they walked home with $90 in their pockets. Now, here's the thing. I, like, maths is not my friend. I'm not going to lie to you. I am terrible at maths. I was like, literally bottom of my class all the time for maths. It's awful. But I did a wee quick calculation here. And I worked that out to be they would need to fill 360 crates. 
it's full of oranges just to earn that $90 to come home each week to the kids. Now, that, I just think it's really hard to feed a family of nine people on $90. And you've got all your other expenses, you've got all your other bills to pay, you've got clothes to buy, you've got nappies, you've got all these things to have to buy on $90 is not very much money. So the parents set off to work. James and Annie, off they go, ready for the day's work ahead. Now, just before they go, James goes upstairs to find the babysitter, Dorothy. Dorothy is the daughter of the family who live above and Dorothy, most days, will look after the younger kids. Some of the kids are a bit older, so they can go to school. But Dorothy looks after the younger kids. So, James goes up. He says, that's us off to work now. Is Dorothy ready to come down and look after the kids? And her mother... Bessie says, no, sorry, Dorothy is out today. She's doing errands. I've got her doing lots of things that she needs to be doing today. So James is like, oh, okay, what are we going to do here? Can you look after the younger kids and... Bessie, she says, yeah, okay, that's fine, I'll come down, I'll look after the kids, that's okay, that's fine, I can do that. There's a kind of, like, system here that's happening where, like, people who lived in these apartments and lived in quite close proximity would often try and help each other out. So if someone needed babysitting or if someone needed help or if someone needed whatever, you know, there there was just a community. There was a sense of community. So Dorothy wasn't available that day. So Bessie steps in. That's fine. Now I'm just going to tell you this about Bessie. This is where it gets a little bit complicated. Bessie was really good friends with James and Annie, but something had gone very wrong. James had taken Bessie's husband away for a weekend to Jacksonville lads weekend lads 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 and Bessie's husband never returned and why well because when they were there James introduced Bessie's husband to his cousin who he then decided he was in love with. So, he shacked up with her (laughs) and left Bessie behind. So Bessie never, ever forgave James for the fact that her husband was fine. They were in a loving relationship until the point that he'd gone on a weekend away with James. And that's where it all went wrong. 
for Bessie. Her whole world collapsed at that point. Her husband just didn't come home. He just didn't come home. Because he found someone else. And he wanted to be with the person that he'd found that wasn't Bessie. And Bessie could not quite forgive James for that. Now, I just, for me, I... I feel like that's a that's a really odd situation to be in. So I'll just I'll break away for a second from this story to just tell you about the story of my friend Debbie who was in a loving and committed relationship she was totally into what she was living in. Now, I was working on a project and I needed some help with it, so I got Debbie involved. And also, I got another guy involved that she'd never met called Johnny. So, Johnny, me and Debbie, we're all working on the project together. That's fine, we're having a Great time, the project goes really well, we have lots of success with it. What I didn't really know that was happening at the time (laughs) was that actually the two of them were sort of falling in love with each other. And so, Debbie left her husband and Johnny left his partner, and the two of them are now, I mean, they're in a great place now, they're in a fucking great place now, they've got two young kids, they're really happy, but I will forever feel like I was the dick in the situation because I was the person that brought them together, now I had nothing to do with them getting together. It's just that you're the person in that moment who brings those people together. You just happen to be that person. So I understand that Bessie was really angry with James. But in a way, James hadn't really done anything wrong. He'd actually just been himself and it's unfortunate that Bessie's husband decided he was going to leave her and run off with someone else. So on this day, James gives Bessie her instructions. He says... The rice and the beans are in the fridge. Make sure that every one of my children eat the entire bowl of rice. Don't let them waste a drop. Betty says, Okay, I will. So it's lunchtime, and the kids gather round the table. It's 12.30. So the kids who've been at school, they come home for lunch, and the kids that Bessie's looking after, they all sit round the same table. Bessie takes the rice out of the fridge, and she splits it. Seven ways. All of the kids around the table, they eat up that rice. After this, she takes the plates away. She cleans them. And the day continues. So later in the afternoon... One of the older daughters begins to feel 
unwell at school. Her teacher says she was gripping her school desk and it looked like she was going to faint. In another classroom, another one of the Richardson children, she was experiencing the same symptoms. She was struggling to stand. In a third classroom, another Richardson daughter was going through the exact same thing. She couldn't stand. All three of these daughters were taken to the school nurse. Okay, so now all three daughters are with the school nurse and they're all suffering similar symptoms. Can't stand, they're weak, they, they can barely speak at this point. The principal of the school, and I, oh, I love this, I love this man. He came to see what was going on in the nurse's office and he says immediately, something is really wrong here. Something is horribly not right with these girls. So, what he does is, he puts them into his car and dr- drives them to the local hospital. By this point, none of the girls are able to even speak any words. They cannot articulate anything. They couldn't form words. They're struggling to stay conscious. They're limp. God bless this principal. He carried them one by one into the hospital. So he brings all three girls out of his car. He brings them into the hospital. And he shouts at the top of his voice, you need to stop whatever you are doing right now and help these girls. Stop whatever you're doing and help them. So the nurses and the doctors, they jump into action and the three Richardson daughters are seen by doctors immediately. Doctors look at these three girls and they think, what is going on here? They're all foaming at the mouth. They're all limp. They can't move and they can't speak. What is happening? So, to go back to the house, the younger children in the house are in the same state. So, Bessie, in a complete moment of panic, doesn't know what to do, so she calls the school and she says, can the older siblings, can the older three Richardson daughters please come home and look after these younger ones because they're currently foaming at the mouth, they're ill, they're being sick everywhere. And the school receptionist says no, because they've been taken to the hospital. So Bessie is freaking out. She is absolutely losing her mind. She calls the police. She calls the police and she says, I have four children here who are all severely ill and there's three kids at school. They too are severely ill. I don't know what's happening and I need help. 
So when police arrive, they see Bessie. They see the four children who are all writhing in pain, screaming, crying, foaming at the mouth. And they call an ambulance and all of these kids are taken to the hospital. The next thing police do is they place a call to the Orange Grove where James and Annie are working and they say there is a medical emergency. They don't really explain what that is, they just say the words medical emergency. So James and Annie set off for the hospital fearing the absolute worst. They think at this point that one of their kids is in desperate danger. They just don't know what they're going to face. They don't know what they're going to have to face when they get to the hospital. They think something terrible has happened to one of their kids. Bessie at this point is hysterical beyond all belief. She is screaming and crying and doesn't know what to do. So James and Annie get to the hospital and the first person that they meet is Bessie. She is standing outside of the hospital and she's smoking a cigarette and they run to her and they ask what is happening and she says go inside I don't want to be the one to tell you once inside a doctor meets them he takes them to a private room and with tears in his eyes He says that six of their children are dead. Only one child has survived. Mm. James and Annie are absolutely unable to process this information, of course. Of course they are. How the fuck would you be ever able to process that information? By now the police are at the hospital and in complete shock, complete shock, James says to the police officer, what has happened? And he says, Your six children are dead. James says, You're a liar. This is not true. And the officer says to him, You better believe it, boy. Your kids are dead. So immediately, the police begin an investigation. Annie and James are questioned. What was in the house that could harm them? What was the last meal they ate? Who prepared it? How was it prepared? Who fed them that day? Why did you do it? Are you lying to me or are you telling me the truth? Are you lying to me? You had too many kids. Is that why you wanted rid of them? Why did you harm them? You're saying you didn't. I'm saying different. Whose word in a court are they going to believe? 
Annie, in her interviews, she racks her brain. She she can only come up with the fact that there might have been rat poison in the house. But she can't be sure. She can't be sure where it was stored, where it was... Might it have gotten into the food? She can't remember. So they asked James, was there poison in the house? And he says, I don't know, I think there might have been rat poison at some point, I'm I'm not really sure. So they say to him, describe the last 48 hours. What was it like? And he says, it was normal. We went to work. The kids went to school. They came home. We ate our meals together. There was nothing different in the last 48 hours than just how we lived our life. Police ask, was there anything else that might have happened in the past 48 hours that we should know about? And James says, Well, yes, there was one thing. There's one thing that I should bring up. The night before this happened, a man knocked on their door. Who was he? Well, he was an insurance salesman. He was there to sell life insurance. And James was interested. The man said he could offer James a a good deal on his seven kids and his wife. Now, James was interested, but he didn't have the money up front to pay straight away so James turned the man away but the man said to him it's okay it's okay if you don't have the money now I can come back I can come back at some point and make sure that your family all have life insurance So police prick up their ears when they hear this. A man interested in life insurance. The night before, all of his children are to be taken in to the hospital, six of whom are dead. So, just to be really clear here, police have already decided that James is guilty. There's no doubt for them. What they don't have is the evidence. I mean, in their mind, James is 100% the man who did this. They're absolutely convinced they just don't have the fucking evidence to be able to do anything. So the house is searched from top to bottom. Every dish, every trace of food, every item of clothing, over 30 items are taken from the house And what they find on these items taken from the house is traces of poison. That's all that police wanted. So now they have all of these things from James's house and they're 
all covered in poison. One police officer from the time will recall that he said to Annie, how could you and your husband knowingly kill your children? And she replies, I couldn't, but he could. Now, that might just be memory doing that thing that it does. You know the way that we all like to kind of remember things differently. We all like to reinvent. We all like to make things up to suit a particular situation. I've, um, <laughs> you know, just when when stories get out of control and we all start to tell our own different version of stories. I've got a friend, um, Frankie, and she's known as the Story Monitor. And so quite often we'll be out at a party or we'll be in a pub or we'll be doing whatever and she'll whisper into my ear, story monitor, story monitor. (laughs) And basically it's because she is someone who loves, 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 loves to go, "Mm, I'm sorry, when you told that story the first time, It was like this. You're now telling us version 18 of the story and it's not actually true anymore. So there's like, we've got a friend called Rhea who, and we were at a party one night and um, yeah, I can remember this moment. So Rhea's standing at one side of the room and there's a really lovely moment where there's a man at the party who comes over to her and he is drunk at his face she's drunk he kisses her (laughs) like really randomly just this man just walks over kisses her and says I'm going to make you my wife, you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, I love you And, of course, it's just drunken nonsense. Anyway, the two of them are now happily married. They've got beautiful kids. You know, everything's, like, really good for them. But when Rhea tells this story, it does just get a bit, like, ridiculous. So there's the truth that we all remember happening. Then there's, like, when she tells it, there's, like, oh... Romantic music was playing in the background and it was just so amazing. And like by version three of the story, she's like, I was in a, I was in a long white dress and I was I'm like, no, you weren't in a long white dress at all. <laughs> like, she was like, he was wearing a tuxedo. No, he wasn't wearing a tuxedo at all. That's absolutely true. By the 80th time she's told this story, I mean, literally... It's like, she's telling it like, uh, so um, I was standing in the corner of the room, I was wearing a long white dress, he rode in on horseback, and the two of us, we just rode off into the sunset. And it's like, that's where (laughs) Frankie is in my ear going, story monitor, story monitor, because we need to remember that actually things (laughs) do get twisted. With time, things do get twisted. You like to re-remember things in a way that are not not how they happened. Not how they happened at all. And I I know that sounds really terrible. Love Rhea. (laughs) Love her husband. But I I remember that night and it wasn't that. He he, he was steaming, drunk. She was drunk. (laughs) He just walked over to her, kissed her, and yeah, it was a lovely moment, but there was no horseback involved. There was no fucking 
there was nothing romantic about that moment, okay? There was nothing romantic about it. But this is how we all read remember stories. This is how we... Yeah. Okay. That's how it happens. So whether Annie ever, ever said those words about James... It's just mythology. We'll never know if she ever said the words about him. So police and forensics, they go through the house and they discover that there is poison everywhere. It's in the toothbrushes. It's over every piece of cutlery. It's on every plate. It's Everywhere. They find it in the clothing. The poison they're finding is a really deadly poison. It's like a interaction with it will literally kill you. Like it will kill you dead if you interact with this poison. Now, while this is happening, their seventh child dies. Hmm. So now the Richardsons are in a place where I just, oh, I can't even imagine. I just would never want to be in that place in my life. It's every single one of their kids are dead. Police continue to search But the poison, they're still looking at James. And lo and behold, they find a bag of what's called Perithion in the family shed. Perithion is a deadly toxin and it's used to kill rodents. This poison is the most dreadful of poisons. It, it causes anyone in contact with it to die. There is absolutely no chance of survival with Perithian. It's used for rodents. And if you ever had to use it, you would need to wear the thickest gloves and be sure that it didn't come into contact with your skin at all. Because your skin would just begin to burn immediately. Can you imagine what that's like if you have ingested that poison. Police say this is what killed the children. Two weeks pass and the funeral for the children arrives. The funeral has to be held in a large community space. It's big enough to hold seven coffins. At the funeral completely unable to cope with the grief that's in front of them both James and Annie collapse so now the press they want a story so there's seven children being killed Big story. Big, big story. Everyone's interested. Swarms of press. They start to gather around the family. Swarms of press. They begin to gather around James and Annie. The next thing that's going to happen is exactly what the press wanted. James and Annie are arrested 
straight after the funeral for the murder of their children. So now information starts to be released about the couple. Both of them had other children in other places. Annie had had three kids that she had left behind. James had multiple children. An estimated number, oh my God, get this, was that he had had 24 kids in his life to other women and he didn't know where they were. But, and this is a ball buster, James had two kids who had already died. One child had died of dehydration and one had starved to death. It's not looking good for the couple at all. Now this case ends up being tried in the media in the way that it always does. Of course it does. The way that we all want Patsy and John to be guilty. In the way that we all want the McCann parents to be guilty. In the way that we all want Tonya Harding's mother to be the cause of her fuck up. I've said this before on the podcast. It just wraps everything up in a neat bow when you can go. It was the parents. It was this. It was the parents were the problem. The parents were the cause of this death. That's what you, that's what people want. They just want it wrapped up in that really nice way. And I never I'll never be satisfied if that's the world that we live in. Where we just we want to just wrap things up that nicely in a bowl because it just it isn't true it just isn't how it it actually happens <sighs> so now there's a bit of a complicated back and forth where Annie takes a lie detector test and she passes What in the house could harm them? Nothing. What was the last meal they ate? They ate the rice I cooked. Who prepared it? Me. How was it prepared? From leftovers. Who fed them that day? Bessie, why did you do it? I didn't. Did you kill your children? No. Annie passes the test. James doesn't. The lie detector senses that he isn't telling the whole story. So now the focus is entirely on James. He gets a lawyer and the lawyer says this is unfair. He's being tried by the media. The lawyer actually kicks up enough of a fuss 
about this that the judge who will end up providing over this case steps in and says right everybody shut up I'm looking after this case and this is unbelievable it's actually fucking unbelievable the judge says I want to try this man honestly but I believe him to be guilty I mean what the fuck a judge fucking actually saying he's it how has how has James got any chance in the world how has he got any fucking legs to stand on if at the judge before his trial is saying I want to try this man fairly but I also know he's guilty oh, I mean come on I know this was 1967 but fuck it's so annoying fuck so this is what happens next James is put in to jail for three months before his trial will happen and in this time three people from inside of prison they will come forward and they will say that James confessed to them that he had killed his children they say he talked in detail about the poisoning the fact that he had planned to kill his children on that day so now with this evidence from these three jail informants it's like well what what's even the point in a trial why even have a trial because you know he's confessed he said he did it three separate people have heard it (sighs) this is where i'm going to tell you how fucked the justice system was because james wasn't charged with the murder of his seven children he was charged with the murder of his eldest child why well the thinking of the state was if he gets off with this then what we can do is we can charge him with the murder of the second eldest child and if he gets off with that we can charge him with I can't believe I'm saying this with the murder of the third child and so on and so on and so on because they were so convinced James was guilty that rather than have a position where they charge him for all seven at the one time and he might got off with it they thought I'll tell you what we'll do we'll do it one by one with all of his children so that if he possibly slips through the net if he possibly gets found not guilty for one of them then what we can do is charge him with the next one I mean this is relentless this is fucking horrific for this man to be going through this so like you're you're be so the idea is to try him one by one for the death of his kids oh so those people that James had confessed to 
in jail. What happens to them? Well, a week, one week after being so a week, one week after James's supposed confession, they are all freed. Hmm. How bloody convenient. I'm going to go to the other side of the room right now to just express how fucking angry I am about this system. I just, I don't want to shout in your ears, so I'm just going to do it from a distance. Oh, how fucking stupid is this situation? How fucking ridiculous? How much is this fuck? This is a fucking fuckhead of a situation. This guy does not need to be in prison. The three fucking people that he supposedly told, oh yeah, I murdered my kids. No. Where are they? They're fucking free at this point. I am fucking so raging. They just, please, just literally wanted someone, anyone at this point that they could fucking pin this on and they fucking pinned it on him. Fucking... Okay, well, I feel a bit calmer now, so... So the trial starts. And I'm just going to say this because I'm angry about this. An African-American man is being tried for the murder of his seven children. And the jury is made up of 12 people, one woman, 11 men, all of whom are white. Seven of the people on that jury were openly members of the Ku Klux. I just, like, I just literally can't even cope with that. I just can't even fucking deal with how... That's my... I just... What the fuck? What the fuck? Oh my god, I'm so annoyed. This is a fucking unbelievable. He doesn't stand a chance. He does not stand a chance at this point. Guilty or not, he doesn't stand a fucking chance. So the trial begins and two of the supposed people that James confessed to get up and they say, yeah, he told me. Yeah, he told me he did it. Yeah, he said that he killed his seven kids and whatever. Now, 37 people were called to stand up in this court case, but who wasn't called? Bessie. What? I mean, what the fuck? She was there. She was there on the day. She is absolutely pivotal to this whole entire day. But she was never called. The defence, the major defence for James is Annie in this case. 
His wife stands up and she makes the most impassioned speech where she says, there is no way that he did this. I know this man. I love this man. We loved our kids. There is no way he did this. I know he didn't. Staff from inside the prison are brought in to be James's defence and they say since the minute James has been in this prison he has done nothing but cry. He cries daily and he won't accept communication from anyone else. His heart is entirely broken by the loss of his children. The prosecution say different. They say this is a man who was working all the hours. He was tired. He was sick of working all these hours for his children. And the best thing that could happen is to make those children go. Just make them disappear. Because then his workload, it wouldn't be what it has to be right now. Getting rid of your kids. Getting rid of that burden you've got in your life. That would be a way for James to live. So the jury hear all of this. They retire for 30 minutes. They come back. And the verdict against James Richardson is guilty. James Richardson is sentenced to death. Annie at this point is talking to anyone who will listen. She's saying, I know my husband did not do this. And no, he didn't. Now, oh, fuck me, man. What a terrible, terrible place for her to be in. All seven of her kids died within 24 hours. And now her husband is in prison for killing them. And she is out doing whatever she can to say, he didn't do this. I swear to God, he didn't. Fucking horrible. I admire her strength in that moment so much to be able to just go, I need to stand by my husband. But she knows in her heart, she knows he didn't do it. So now a man called Mark Lane comes into the picture. Mark Lane is a writer and an investigative journalist. And he's absolutely sure that an injustice has happened here. So Mark Lane, after hours of interviews with Annie and talking at length with James is utterly convinced that this is wrong. James should not be in prison. So he starts the free James Richardson campaign. And interestingly, there are thousands of people who believe that James has been wrongly convicted. There are thousands who believe James is in prison 
for a crime that he didn't commit. He should not be a man waiting for death row because he just didn't commit this crime. Mark Lane really is my hero in this story. He just, he really goes above and beyond and I just, yeah, I just think, you know what, see if you're going to, see if you're going to just be a good human being. This is like the best example of how you can be just a good human being. He goes and he hunts down those supposed prisoners that James confessed to oh I killed my children and whatever and they all say the same thing to him they say that was a total lie it was a total lie he never said those words he never said them I I said that he said them for a shorter sentence Mark Lane asks those people straight in the face, he says, how can you live with yourself about this? How can you live with yourself with the fact that actually you just completely lied to make a man go to prison for something that he never did? And they say, well, we want it out. I want it out. I just wanted out of this situation. Mark Lane is doing everything that he can in his power to get the entire case uprooted. He's doing everything that he can to turn it on its head, to try and just make it into, well, actually the mess that it was. He's, he's doing his best to try and unpick it and just pull it apart the best that he can. He starts sending out flyers all over Florida, which say James Richardson has been wrongfully convicted. He does some investigation, and what he does is he goes back and he looks at Bessie. Now, Bessie, by this stage, she's in her 60s and she's suffering from Alzheimer's. This does not stop Lane. He doesn't really give up. He knows, yeah, he's like, fine, she's suffering from Alzheimer's. But he also knows that the wrong man is in jail. And when he talks to Bessie, Bessie has some very interesting things to say. When Lane goes to interview Bessie, she says, Lord, help me. I killed those children. I pray the Lord will forgive me. So, Lane, what does he do? He has the information that he wants, but she's old. She's got Alzheimer's now. Is she talking nonsense is she so far into her Alzheimer's that she doesn't even know what she's talking about Lane asks the nurses to record what Bessie has to say on a daily basis so they do over a week they record everything Bessie has to say and when he gets the tapes at the end 
of the week. All that he hears is Bessie saying, O oh Lord, I killed those children. O oh God, forgive me. I never meant them to die. So, Lane, what does he do? Well, he enlists the help of one of the most powerful women in the world. Janet Reno. Janet Reno is one of America's most successful lawyers. She's quite famous now in popular culture. She sort of, like... So it was like a Family Guy episode or something. I wish she pops up in or something weird like that. She at one point, I th- yeah, she was part of Bill Clinton's administration. At one point, she is a fierce, fierce woman, a fierce lawyer who will take on any case, and she will rip it apart. She will. Absolutely, rip it to, apart, and until she gets what she wants. So Janet, yes, Janet's on board. Great, good news. Janet says, "Right, okay, what can we do here?" She says, "I want the case retried," and she gets it retried. And then now. She starts to really pull it apart. She gets investigators working everywhere on this case. She gets him to go back over all of the old evidence. I mean, it was it was years ago, but she gets them going through every single thing. And what Janet discovers through her investigation is that actually the real killer was Bessie. What the police had failed to investigate was that Bessie was on parole for murder. Bessie had killed her husband with poison in a casserole that she had made. Janet Reno knew at that moment that Bessie was the one who had killed those seven children and not James. And so Bessie was brought into court. Now, she had Alzheimer's. She was in a whole different world at this point. But when asked about the Richardson child's death, she said, Lord, forgive me. I killed those children. The question is why? Why did Bessie snap that day? Why did she decide that she wanted to poison the kids and watch all seven of them die? Well, the answer is James... She thought had led her husband away into the arms of another woman. And it's not really the truth. It's not really it's not really what happened. It's just that James happened to go out with his friend and he happened to meet someone else.
James Richardson spent 21 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. He lost seven children. He lost his life. But Annie, knowing, knowing that he could never have done this, she stood by him. She absolutely, 100% stood by her husband because she knew he wasn't guilty. James was exonerated and set free. Bessie was brought to court for the murder of the seven Richardson children, but Bessie was so far gone into the later stages of Alzheimer's. She was she was given a piece of paper and she was asked to write down the names of every child that she had killed in that family and she wrote down as best she could all seven kids in that family. She was found guilty but the development of Alzheimer's meant that she couldn't be put in prison. Instead, she went back to a facility and she lived for two more years and then she died. James was free. He was out there. Annie was loving the fact that James was back 21 years he spent in prison. 21 fucking years for a crime you did not commit. Imagine that. Just imagine everybody thinking for 21 years that you had killed your own children. James says... The treatment from the justice system is an affront to black men. To those who are innocent, I will fight every day to make sure that no person in America is ever wrongfully convicted again. And so ends the story of James Richardson. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Get in touch. Let me know what you think. This case, I'll be honest with you, it leaves me with a lot of anger. It leaves me with a lot of rage because there's so much in this that I'm just, yeah. I can't, I like, I can't, I can't be satisfied with this story at all. And I'd love to be, but I just feel... There's so much injustice. There's so much fucking racism. There's just so much. Oh, I just, yeah, I can't even fucking deal with how annoyed it makes me. I just, I'm fucking livid about it. And I know it's like, it's one of those things where you go, oh, it's, it's happened in the past. It's done, but it's still something. Someone's life was taken away for 21 years years for something they didn't do and also seven kids died because of fucking one woman's actions and uh, yeah they you know what do you know what I hope 
I hope that there's maybe a day in the future where we can have a conversation about injustice that's that's going to be better than um <clears throat> than this story was okay if you want to get in touch uh, you can <laughs> i'm always about <laughs> If you want to talk to me, you can join the Facebook group. Just do it. Just do it. Just join the Facebook group. Come on. You'll not regret it. It's great. I promise you. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> um, if you want to get me on Twitter, you can. If you want to get me on Instagram, you can do that too. Any, oh, I was asking this. Any merchandise ideas you've got? Hit me with them. Get in touch. Get in touch with anything you like. I'm loving the suggestions so far for, like, all the merchandise of, like, a mug with a shouty man on it or a um, tea towel. I'm, just, I'm really loving it so far. So, if you want to get in touch, please do. It would be lovely to hear from you. Okay. If you know a great story... An extraordinary story. Then get in touch. Okay. Goodbye. It didn't. It didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's get it over.